Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. everyone and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I am speaking with Heather Fink. Heather is the founder of the cosmetic line, The Sexiest Beauty. You can find it online at thesexiestbeauty.com. Welcome, Heather. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm so excited. Yeah, exactly. Right. (laughs) Getting into it. I am so excited to kind of climb through um, with you. I haven't spoken to too many people who've been involved with the cosmetic industry and I want to, I've hit on your website and I'm excited to kind of climb in the ins and outs of it. And before I do that, I'll read a bio on Heather, but for those of you listening, a roadmap of today's podcast so that you can follow along. We'll first look at Heather's academic background and early professional life, and then we'll turn our efforts towards unpacking the sexiest beauty um, cosmetic line and the website, thesexiestbeauty.com. We'll first get into the nuts and bolts of it, the brick and mortar of who, what, when, where, why, how, funding, co-founders, all of that stuff. And then we'll turn our efforts towards looking at the ethos and maybe some of the change that's happened within um, the time period since the launch. And after that, we will look towards goals that Heather may have, both for herself and um, as the founder of The Sexiest Beauty. And then we'll wrap everything up with advice that Heather may have for those of you who are looking to get involved or emulate some of her career's success. A quick bio on Heather before we start peppering her with questions. For over 25 years, Heather Fink has been developing world-class beauty products for some of the sexiest, most sophisticated, provocative, edgy, fashion-forward brands in the world. She led the teams at Victoria's Secret Beauty, MAC, Essie, BB, and Agent Provocateur in the creation of some of the most iconic products ever seen in beauty, and has the privilege of partnering with the best creative talents, labs, and suppliers from around the world. Her experiences at L'Oreal, Lauder, the Limited, um, Interparfums, and QVC afford her enormous insights and resources related to trend, innovation, and the beauty marketplace. Heather was inspired to fuse the elements from her vast history with the powerful voices of real people speaking their truth to create a brand with an authentic point of view, redefining the global concept of the sexiest beauty. So Heather, I cannot wait to climb through that with you. However, before we get started there, can you paint us a background of what your early academic and or professional life looked like so we know kind of the platform you you began this journey on? Sure. Um, It really all started um, in beauty, Um, but I came to beauty through um, a major in French Um, I went to college, I was a pre-med major actually, and then decided I wasn't really big on, you know, chemistry and things like that. Um, But I had always had a love for the language, for languages, and particularly French. And uh, so I changed my major to French and lived in France. Uh, I went to school and and graduated with a degree in French. And I, I had always wanted to live in New York City. So I packed up with a girlfriend. Um, We were from Pennsylvania and we moved to New York and I went on some interviews um, at a French bank and a a French hotel and um, a French cosmetics company was L'Oreal and they were the first ones that offered me the job, a job. And uh, so I started at L'Oreal fresh out of college. Wow. What year was that? It was in the 80s. It was 19, I always forget if it was 88 or 89, but it was the late 80s. Well, and I only ask because not to date any of us, though I do think that um, age and beauty have, you know, very little to do with each other. I, because um, it, Paris changed a lot in the 80s and 90s. You know, it was a very different France in general kind of went through mm-hmm. especially with the beauty scene. The world over really did, you know, when you climb through the fads. But that's an exciting time to be um, with L'Oreal in 
in France. So did you stay there um, for very long or did you move on? I was in France for school, but I was at L'Oreal in New York. Oh, in New York. Okay. Yeah. And how long were you with L'Oreal, give or take? I was, I was only with them for about a year. And my boss there uh, went to a startup of, with The Limited, which became Victoria's Secret Beauty and, and Bath and Body Works. It was before the first products existed wow. for either of those companies. It was a big boom. So, it was a big time. So, yeah. So I was at L'Oreal for a year and then I went to the limited. So you followed your, your su supervisor, your boss over there? I did. I did. Nice. And then job. from that environment, how long were you there and what propelled you on to the next? I was there for 12 years and uh, the company um, then sort of all merged and a lot of it um, moved to Columbus, Ohio and and there was a lot of um, change going on. And a, another mentor from there, who I had spent the 12 years with there, took me a, along with her to the water. And I started at MAC. MAC's exciting. I, their, their backstory of MAC, the cosmetic world, uh, while I'm not too um, fully versed, MAC's um, attachment to the stage and um, some of those actorships and yeah. things like that is very different than the narrative of a lot of other cosmetic lines, right? Yeah, and that has really informed a lot um, with, well, I guess both of these um, brands have uh, my current uh, company, uh, the brand I created, um, The Sexiest Beauty, has been informed by both of those, and they both made a really big influence on me, both Victoria's Secret and Mac. And to your point, uh, when I started at Mac, uh, it was when they had re moved from uh, Toronto, Canada, or had they, some people were still there, but the, comp the main uh, company itself had moved uh, under Lauder's umbrella in New York. So it was a really big time. And um, as you mentioned, a lot of it uh, was was inspired, well, it was all inspired by the makeup artists and about the professional side of what they do. And so my job there was to create the products with them that they needed to use in their daily life that then would also, be, um, you know, be relevant for the, uh, for the everyday consumer. I love that too, that story, just because um, it kind of reaches into market testing or, um, the idea of, you know, running focus groups or things that other mm -hmm. businesses tend to do a lot more of, but I feel like the cosmetic industry and a lot of female-based industries were developed by people who weren't necessarily even using the product or the, the, you know, the population that were going to do it and therefore had this kind of like unapplicable um, aspect to it. You know, a lot of the um, the male owned, and not that men don't wear makeup, but men who don't wear makeup owning and running a cosmetic company. I, I'm always wondering how that, you know, how that makes sense. And so to have someone develop it with the, you know, the artists that are using it and yeah. applying it, it's just that relationship becomes so much the utility, I suppose, of the product and the business is built into that. I'm wondering, so with all of this like really vast experience, before you launched The Sexiest Beauty what piece of your history do you think you took most from it and inspired you to to do go off and launch your own thing? Um, what piece of it? Well, I guess um, the love for the product, the love for what I feel um, the empowerment that beauty and beauty products and these tools um, enable in, in others. I love to see someone take a product. So it's that passion for the product and the, and, and what it, what it does for someone. Absolutely. What it can do for someone. Were there, were there different companies that you worked for or different positions that you held that taught you more um, about that than others? Was Mac more prone to it than others? Or did they all have like kind of their own unique take on how they came at the product and beauty? Yeah, they had, uh, I definitely learned a lot everywhere that I've been. Um, I've learned everything everywhere I've been. Um, Victoria's Secret, and a lot of times my roles were very broad, which, which was fantastic. I, I, I'm so happy. I'm so lucky that it was that way. Um, my roles were almost always across the board in these past 30 years um, from soup to nuts from the beginning to the end. So from the concept all the way to the in-store execution, yeah. everything along the way, the operations, the financial part of it, the P&L, 
the, the product itself, the packaging. I didn't handle the packaging, but I worked with the teams that did, and I was responsible to make sure that it all came together. Um, and that's my favorite part when all the little, when there's some, something that doesn't even exist, typically, you know, it's a concept comes to fruition and all those little pieces come together, you know, typically from around the world, yeah. um, all these little parts come together. So I was really, so, um, so Victoria's Secret is where I got that foundation in creating a product from the concept and being responsible all the way through to the, to, to the in store, you know, through the execution. And then at Mac, um, I was able to work directly with the artists and, and this even broader team of people, um, uh, you know, from product and creative was really a critical um, decision making factor um, mm. at, at Mac. So collaborating with all those people and it was more of a global scale than um, Victoria's Secret. So that's where I got my first global experience, you know, with international and um, abroad. Yeah. And uh, then Essie was really, was my next step. And that was really fashion. I mean, not that Mac, what Mac was really fashion driven too, but Essie's all, all of the products were based around a fashion theme. So that, that was something. And I was also responsible for everything there, including PR. So I got, and Essie was always very um there was a lot of pr and collaboration so i got mm -hmm. that from from my time at sc so definitely big things um important things from every every role qvc i worked directly with all the founders of all the brands that were launched at Q and carried at qvc so wow that was amazing that's a lot qvc sounds like a, a like a dictionary of you know like just a yeah. labyrinth of like the amount of <laughs> different brands and products that they have going through there. Um, yeah. It sounds like you were curated, like you were uniquely kind of groomed into being um, a, a founder of your own line, you know, from handling all the responsibilities to uh, product and envisioning all the way down to packaging. You, you must have had a very good sense of what you were doing, or at least where you wanted to do your own product when you launched into it. And to that end, I want to start unpacking the sexiest beauty Mm -hmm. um, first up front, when did you found it? What year um, did you take any funding? And are you the sole founder or do you have co-founders? It was in 2017. It was the product uh, launched at the end of 2017. Um, my website launched in April of 2018. So that was just two years um, anniversary a few weeks ago. Um, I'm the sole founder and the sole uh, funder. Um, I didn't take any funding, um, and I think that might have covered your question. Yeah. What one. was the <laughs> yeah? What was the impetus for it? Like, what was the cause for you to go off and launch it? Had it been a long time coming, or was it just one day? Like, I'm going to launch my own line. It was one day. I'm going to launch my own line. I think you mentioned, uh, you know, just sort of like the grooming of of the universe. I think. Really, I think everything unfolded um, the way it was supposed to, including losing my job in 2016, which was not of my own choosing. Um, I, I, you know, it was uh, very difficult. And um, that was the question I answered uh, for my daughter's question this morning. I was telling you before we got on about the most challenging thing you've gone through and, and you know, some subsequent questions to that. And that was my answer, um, losing my job in 2016 mm -hmm. and then trying to find another one for the next year or so. Um, and uh, that, you know, that was uh, also very difficult and challenging to not really be able to, the difficult part was not finding one. Um, yeah. And throughout that, um, I, or really at the, you know, at the one year mark or so, um, uh, one year and change, I just finally started on a very small scale, putting together, you know, it's what do I love to do? And what am I passionate about? And what do I know? Um, I just started putting a brand together. Um, and I, I started with uh, these three lipsticks. And that was the beginning of the sexiest beauty. So it definitely wasn't a forethought, um, you know, or pre-planned um, proposition. It, it was something that 
I just started doing um, because I love it and it's what I know. And uh, that's how, that's how it, it all came about. What was the hardest part in the beginning? Because <clears throat> this changes over time, right? As you navigate the waters of, of being a, um, a, an early entrepreneur and founder of a company, was it, um, I feel like for me, my knowledge of like um, distributors or the people who are designing and, and making um, the formulas or across referencing what um, ingredients you want in. What was your knowledge base with those things and were any of them daunting for you? I think the hardest part, the most challenging part has always been the, the fin financing of it. Um, but, but, but also, and I guess they go hand in hand is the distribution. Um, mm -hmm. And the which goes hand in hand with the brand awareness. So, um, and it probably starts with brand awareness. I don't have any brand awareness. I have limited funds, and and so how am I going to get, you know, accomplish any sales? Which I didn't really think about at the beginning. Which is probably a good thing, or I would have never done it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize, you know, coming out of these big brands, I didn't really realize, I mean, it sounds really stupid to say and obvious, but how hard it was, that I didn't have any brand awareness. I mean, I realized that, but that, how difficult it, it, it is to build that. Um, so I didn't take it for granted, but it was something that I al always had the luxury of working with brands that, ha that had that already built in. And so my mm -hmm. job had really just been create the products that fit within that brand DNA, um, you know, and bring them to market. Um, so the, the most challenging thing for me has been building brand awareness. Absolutely. And there's so many different ways to do it. And they're constantly being rewritten, you know, with the social media platforms and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the changing darlings of social media platforms. I'm not sure if you know this, but Instagram is no longer the prima donna. It's switching over. Rumor has what? it, it's now supposed to be moving, <laughs> kid you not, rumor from Silicon Valley is Pinterest and LinkedIn are supposed to be the next like heavy hitters because oh, they wow. become inundated, right? When something becomes too saturated, so you, everyone advises get creative, like go to a different area, go to a place where you can kind of make more of a splash. And those two platforms, while they seem very um, swollen already, are more underused with a lot of marketing techniques. And uh -huh. I don't doubt it because I remember the first time I heard about someone posting, um, a job ad on Instagram. And I thought, what are you doing? This is a site for pictures. I just had no idea that, you know, that it was going to start being utilized in all of those different ways. So, right. yeah, I mean, I would think when you talk about marketing and brand awareness and all of those things that tied in, particularly when you come from massive companies, even when you've carried on a lot of roles and you have it all, we tend to take for granted anytime we're involved in a big system like that, like some of the blueprints that were in place that we never really mm -hmm. had to question. And right. brand is one of those beasts, especially when you have hundreds of millions of dollars a year, you can throw at your branding and your marketing, you know, as a company like that. Um, it, it, it does sound daunting. So I want you to kind of crawl us through the sexiest beauty. You mentioned you started off with these three lipstick shades. So why did you start off with those three products and um, what, what came after that? And if someone gets to your website, like what can they purchase right now? What, how is it all kind of set up? Uh, sure. So I started with lipstick uh, for a couple reasons, uh, some personal and some business strategic. Um, uh, so I started, uh, so what is for me the sexy, for me the most empowering tool, the product I use every day when I used to go out the door, now I get on a Zoom meeting is I, I put on a lipstick. I'm a bold lipstick person. Um, so I started, so that's a, a tool that I quote unquote, don't leave home without or don't feel dressed without. Um, it's just, I've always been that way when I look back at pictures of myself, you know, in college and, um, and throughout my life, I've always uh, worn a bold uh, lip. So um, it's kind of like my go-to um, part of my wardrobe. Um, and I also, uh, re I remembered this later, but when I was a little girl, um, I, my grandmom had a vanity that she had a cabinet next to, and I always used to like to go through her beauty products, and I pulled out a nail polish, and I painted my <laughs> lips with her bright red, I could still picture, I could still smell it, a Q-Tex nail polish, 
and I was probably seven or eight years old at the time. So when I even look back on things like that, I guess I always had this um, the tra the transformative power of a beauty product, and for me that was always that has always been a lipstick. Um, you know, I think we were talking even before the call. It's just that that to me is a, a powerful tool. Um, mm -hmm. So I started with lips for, for those reasons, uh, personal and also, and this is kind of an old idea. I don't know if it's really relevant anymore, but when we would do, um, it, a lipstick is a product that a woman has the most of in her, typically, or a man, you know, a, a person would have the most of in their makeup bag, um, would normally be lipstick. And it's also the product that you're, that someone is least loyal to typically so you're, huh. you're willing and able to to try multiple lipsticks from multiple brands and and uh without really thinking about it and they're an affordable luxury um right. so that that was the other reason i started with lips and and it started as one shade it was the, it was a red um i mean it started with three but the idea started with with one um you know what is the sexiest lip lipstick it's typically you know people typically think of a red but I know from uh, experience that a red is sometimes a harder sell or a harder shade to um, to dip your toe in so I, I uh, also included a nude which is a, my number one shade it's out of stock right now um, and one of my girlfriends just texted me she's freaking out she's like why did you tell me you were running low <laughs> yeah. Uh, on this nude shade, it's a great color. It's called Naughty Nude uh, and a burgundy. So I came out with those three shades at the very beginning. Nice. Yeah, they sound well. It sounds like they are doing well if they're out of stock. What did yeah. you do? You have any other products? Did you start branching out from the lipsticks after that? And if so, where did. did you turn to next? I did. So I, I currently have nine of those lipsticks and they're called the matte shine because they're a velvety pigment with a, with a dollop of shine. So it has the pigments of a matte, but then that comfort and, and emollient, the moisture of, of a creamier lipstick. Um, and then I have, I launched a liquid, which is a long wearing liquid. I launched for, for Valentine's day of, of that following year in 2018. Um, and now have 19 shades of that. Wow. Uh, I started, I think I started with four of those. Um, so I've been adding seasonal colors. I've done collaborations. Um, and then also at the launch, uh, there's a makeup remover pad, uh, which is a botanical oils. Uh, it's called a magical uh, miracle because it just takes the, all of that long wearing liquid off in one swipe. Wow. The, it, it's a waterproof um, lipstick, so it doesn't wash off with soap and water or wipe off. It's smudge proof, wipe proof, sweat proof, swim proof. Nice. <laughs> it's called S proof. So. Yeah. Um, so the remover pad, and then there's a clear shine gloss that, that goes over anything or by itself. A lot of guys love that product. Makeup artists love it because you can also use it, you know, like any of the products, but you can use it on your cheeks or your eyes. And then I just launched a, this spring, I just uh, started adding some other categories. So there's a, your, your skin looks like you're wearing the rose face balm. Your, your skin looks amazing. Oh, I, mine. Are we talking yeah. about me or the your potential skin. customer? Why? The thank you. No, but yours looks amazing. I was yeah, talking yeah. about yours. Yeah. Oh, Amy. thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I try, I, I was, I have a, a history of um, women who have pushed that, very idea, very hard. Long before, you know, it was in or anything else. I have a, a grandmother and a great grandmother that had, um, I remember oil of Olay and all sorts yes. of old products, you know, in their, in yes. their bathroom. And it was all about taking care of, of that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so it's, it's important. Family. It's, it's interesting to see it boom and to see different things come and go. And yes. actually to that end, I was, um, I was at, a cosmetic store the other day and I flipped over, well, a few months ago and I flipped over an oil of Olay, you know, I found mm -hmm. this old face cream that looked like the one she'd have these big jars of it and they were glass. Yep. It was back in the day. And, um, I flipped it over to see what was inside of it. And then I had got, became curious as to know whether or not the ingredients had changed over time. I'm certain that they yeah. have, 
But like when you go to develop these things, how much research do you put in or do you have an agent or a third party that puts in research? Because like you're talking about um, lip stains have been kind of the bane of my existence. I wanted to love them when they came out, you know, in the late 90s, early aughts. Yes. I thought it was such a genius idea, but they always like um, crumpled and chalked or sat in crevices um, even when I was younger and my lips were, you know, ready to go. And um, yes. And I, and I know that they've probably perfected some of those sciences, but how much of a guru or a PhD do you yourself have to become before you go and make sure that your line is within that? Can you speak to how you navigated that? Yeah, you brought up some really um, great um, points that we could elaborate on, but to answer the specific question, I'm not a PhD. I'm not a chemist. Some of my family used to say, oh, so you're a chemist or... <laughs> I work with the labs that are chemists and they're amazing. So everything is, is owed to, to the labs um, and the chemists that work there. And I do work with third party labs that I've worked with throughout my uh, career. So they make the products for the other, you know, big brands in the world. Um, so I'm really lucky that I have those partnerships and those resources. How do you navigate? Do you yourself try them out? You know, when you say long lasting lip wear, it sounds like yours is actually working because you're saying it's not coming off with water, sweat, soap, you know, you actually need to kind of wipe it off with a specific yeah. solvent. How do you, do you test everything on yourself first and modify? Because it's one thing when a lab says it does something and it's another thing to have it work on your skin, on someone else's sure. skin. Sure. Sure. You brought up a really good point about uh, what formulas used to be like and, and, and the advances and what they're like now, in particular on the long wear liquid formula that, we were, that we've been talking about. Um, when I started, uh, when they first came out in the 90s, I, I launched one at the time as well. And for, it was at Victoria's Secret. And, and the formulas were just very dry. And to your point about, you know, having, I was 20, 25 years younger at the time. Um, even then, when my lips, I didn't have, you know, really any issues that I currently do as far as, you know, aging and, and things like that, that have affected my skin. Even at the time, I wasn't comfortable and didn't feel like these products looked great on, on me. Um, but it was that benefit that you could put it on and it would last all day. So fast forward 20 some years. And as I was developing my own line, that's what the first thing I said is I can't launch a formula that doesn't look and feel comfortable. And now I'm 20, 25 years older. So there have been major advancements in the technologies and, and, and you know, how they're able to put these ingredients um, together with, with emollient so that this formula now I did. I do wear it. Um, have a, I have the matte shine on today, but oftentimes um, I have it on my hand, but um, I ha I've had it on since yesterday. So I, I try, I do try formulas on. Nice. It's not a great visual, so I'm not, but, but the way I, I, I do try it on my skin, on my, on my lips, um, and, and I've tested it upside down and backwards, you know, for comfort and for long wear. Um, and I've also, um, you know, I do the same, I send samples out. I do the same I've always done where um, I, I put it into panel tests with friends, family. Um, you know, I have a lot of um, makeup artists, friends and, and colleagues that are, um, you know, kind enough to, to try things out and give me their feedback. So, um, and I do the same thing with the shades the colors because I, part of my, um, the principle of my, my line is that the colors are universal. Yeah. Uh, neutrals so that anyone can wear them. You know, you might like a bold lip, you might not like a nude lip, but in, you know, the hope is that the color, whichever you prefer will work for your skin tone. Right. So I'm wondering with that, um, well, first of all, are, do you sell solely through your website? And when you started, did you only go through your website? Do you go through other third parties like Amazon? And um, where are your metrics coming from? What, where's your biggest sale? Um, and where are you converting customers from? Can you speak to any of that? Yeah. Um, and that's been a long and, and really winding road, uh, too. And uh, I'm sold, as you said, on my website and have been since for two years now. Um, I was also sold in some small boutiques in New York when I launched. Those were my first customers. Um, and I, I have a sales team who 
um, has uh, gotten some placements in, um, I'm in a, a chemist in New York, um, a Thompson Chemist downtown, who's known for the kind of like a cult uh, beauty uh, brands and, and following uh, of the locals. Um, and I've been in, um, in the uh, um, uh, Greenbrier Spa in West Virginia, which is a large resort and they have um, a gift shop and, and spa there where it's carried um, on a few e-commerce sites. And I'm launching next week in a new format. It's a virtual store um, called Boutique, who's launching next Wednesday. So that's really exciting. Um, I've dabbled in Amazon, but haven't been able to make the headway that I need to so far there. Yeah. Um, so that's on the list of things to do. Um, I think it's inundated. I think somebody's got to go in and stratis stratify Amazon on some level, you know, because it's, and they know this. I just don't think that they mind right now. I think Bezos has got plenty of money and he's not really concerned about making the user experience uh, any friendlier. But mm -hmm. if I had my druthers, like, it's, um, it, there's just too many, like, I want filters, you know, to apply it where um, people like yourself, like, um, female owned, um, you know, uh, right. USA developed, like all of these different filters right. I want to be able to put over. So we kind of shave off not to degrade any other vendors in the world. Mm -hmm. I love vendors from all countries, but it would just sure. be nice to be able to do some of those things, you know, especially with things like beauty, because it is so hard to find, you know, what you're looking for. Um, when you have, and I love small like beauty lines. I think it's becoming much more vogue as well. Most of, I'm in my forties and most of my girlfriends in my forties very much so want like the newer, more boutique beauty cosmetic line out there, you know, right. before they become MLM or some huge thing. It's just more of an interesting experience. There seems to be more of a curated product, yes. you know, and it's a more avant-garde, it's more up to date. Like all of those things that tend to get lost in translation with the longevity and time. And so yeah, you're yeah. right. And there are, I hadn't re really even thought about it in terms of those kinds of filters, but, and I am both of those things, you know, female owned and uh, made in the USA, which, um, you know, I'm really proud of. I, I think, um, you know, the quality of the formulas uh, uh, are superior um, or slash excellent. I, I, to your point, I, I shouldn't say, you know, better than someone else but the you know the whole made in the usa i know what i'm getting i know where i'm getting it from the yeah. formula is excellent and and that is important and it should you know be um should stand out be able yeah. to yeah and labor practices you know um mm -hmm. one of my huge attentions over the past decade has been you know kind of this anti swept shop mentality and um you you know if you want to stay safe you, you got to stay keep it in countries that have laws that coincide with what you agree with, or what rather I agree with. Um, I'm curious when you um, looking forward, you've launched your your in your like toddlerdom, I would say, of where you know where your company is at. You've gotten out of infancy. You're getting the sales thing ramped up. Um, things have changed, but you have this online experience, and so it seems mm -hmm. like that's kind of a realm that should be still staying afloat. Um, and I'm wondering over, do you set goals like one to three year goals for yourself? Or are you still just kind of churning through every day? And if you do set goals, what are your goals for the next one to three years? Yeah. Um, great questions. Um, my goals are, are moment to moment. Let me get on this call. Okay, goal accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I hope, to, I hope to be in business in one to three years. That's a goal. There you go. Um, Good. Uh, you know, I, I hope to get some funding along the way, um, which, you know, I, I have been working towards. Um, I think the important thing for me right now as a company is to really, um, you know, what where I'm at right now, and, and I think it has partly to do with the, with the uh, situation that we're in as far as, you know, being stay at home and, and uh, retailers are, are closed. A lot of my retailers are closed. My factories are even closed. You know, they're based here. They're actually both in New York. Um, they're, they're closed. So what I'm, I'm doing right now is taking the opportunity to, the, I feel like the word pivot kind of overused, but I'm really focusing on my website, um, focusing on, um, before our call, I, I was starting to look at revamping it. Um, I, actually going in to do, to do the work. 
Um, I've also partnered with a digital agency who we're starting um, this week. Um, you know, it's, it's not something I've ever done before, but uh, I don't know what I'm doing. And as we walked through things, you know, he, he was like, you really, you never set up your Google Merchant Center? I said, well, I couldn't, you know, I had a glitch. I couldn't figure it out. So yeah. I've brought in an expert to help me with that um, for as long as I can. And um, so focusing on, on primarily on that direct to consumer side of it, although I, I think the wholesale and, and being, you know, um, the, the experiential part of, of, of beauty, I guess, in particular, any kind of, um, a beauty is very experiential. So that's also very important to me to, to be in some uh, retailers, brick and mortar per, per se, that you can try and experience the product. I've ramped up sampling, meanwhile, um, on my end so that I can get more samples in people's hands. Um, and also, um, Secondly, or part in part and parcel with that is this new retailer that I'm launching this coming week, um, who was opening a who is an indie beauty um, curated um, uh, space. They were they are planning. They were originally opening a brick and mortar in in Soho that they've. Um, pivoted to become, uh, to do a virtual store. So you're going to be able to walk through this virtual store and then, you know, shop and then click on the brand and then go into the e-commerce site, which is launching this week. So broadening my distribution is a goal um, for sure. Uh, and and, and um, maximizing, I guess, my direct to consumer. But I think they're both important. Yeah, well, and also there's a, you know, there's a group of people, and I think you might be among them, that don't need these hard written vision board goals to keep achieving what they have. You know, you, there's people that keep that in their forefront. Um, I think the rest is for people that kind of tend to chaotically in an ADHD manner kind of lose sight of everything, um, which is neither here nor there. Both individuals are paramount. Um, but I was wondering with the virtual store that you just mentioned, do you have a website for anyone listening who's interested and wants to jump on it next week when it goes live? Yeah, I actually, I think it's boutique.nyc. Okay. Um, but you can Google beauty, it and find it. It's like boutique, only it's boutique. Okay. Boutique.nyc. B-E-A-U-T-Y-Q-U-E. Dot NYC, I believe is the end website, but I'll be posting about it. So if anyone is able to follow um, the sexiest beauty on Instagram or any kind of social, I'll, we're partnering and, and there'll be a, a um, important retail channel that I'll be mentioning regularly. Cool. Sure. So everyone should get on the sexiest beauty and um, follow on any of your favorite social platforms or mm -hmm. jump on the website and find out about it. I'm wondering mm -hmm. as we Thank wrap you. everything up today, um, pieces. So nobody likes to give advice I've found except for like my hairstylist, but I think that, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's just her or it's all hairstylists, but I love them for it. Um, but what I wonder is, if you had come up to yourself a couple of years ago in 2017, a few years ago, and, and um, uh, if that person came up to who you are now and just said, listen, I think I'm going to do this. You know, I lost this position kind of against my will. I've been searching. This is my, my comfort zone, my genius zone. It's, it's where I'm going to do my work. What are the top three pieces of advice you would give um, the 2017 you? Uh, definitely just keep going, you know, do it, um, do it as long as you can, as hard as you can. Um, I also think it's important to, um, you know, self-care is important. So I would remind myself to eat and sleep and, um, you know, exercise and, and do, do those things because it is easy. It, 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 you know, I'm a bit of a workaholic, um, and I also am really passionate about it, do, you know, about what I do. So I have to remind myself to do those things. So I, I would give myself a reminder about that. Drink water. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and just keep going. You know, so many people have, have helped me along the way. Just when I thought I was going to give up, yeah. um, the next person said yes or helped me. And, and that is a very regular occurrence that um, so 
so I guess look for those, I would tell myself to look for those um, signs from the universe. Absolutely. I was listening to an architect the other day who said, um, you have to be naive enough to uh, launch it and, and crazy enough to do it. And then you have to have enough endurance to see it through. And outside yeah. of that, you can well make said. a difference. <laughs> yeah, It's a little insanity, which well mixed with said. a ton of energy, right? It's a, it's a long game endurance. So I've got keep going. Yeah. Self-care is important and drink water. I love those. Those should be on my tombstone or perhaps yours. I love those pieces of advice. They're so perfect, you know? Absolutely. Well, we are out of time, but I want to say, Heather, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time and just giving us all of your unique, candid wisdom. Oh, thanks, Patricia. Thanks for having me. It was great. A real pleasure. Yes. And for everyone listening, we've been, we've been talking with Heather Fink. She's the founder of the cosmetic line, The Sexiest Beauty. You can find her online at thesexiestbeauty.com. And thank you for giving us your time today. Until we speak again next time, remember to always bet on yourself. Sunshine.